Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. So I'm Carrie Goldberg. I'm a health and science reporter here at WBUR and the editor of our Common Health blog. And I'd like to welcome you to our evening on moral injury of healthcare. Um, I'd like to also welcome you to City Space. Can you raise your hand if you've never been here before? Oh, great. You drew them in, you guys. <laughs> Good. So City Space is conceived as a space for important civic discourse. And I think it can be particularly useful for conversations that are uncomfortable for the profession that uh, needs to discuss these topics. And in fact, uh, I was thinking back a couple of years ago, uh, I was asked to moderate a panel on the downsides of electronic medical records. And it was supposed to be at a major academic medical center. And a little bit before it was supposed to happen, we got kind of disinvited from this big <laughs> hospital. And it wasn't very clear to me why. I thought it might have to do with the non-disparagement clauses that hospitals sign with the EMR vendors. Um, but I also thought, you know, maybe it could be that, you know, even here in Boston, our nonprofit hospitals are businesses and their marketing departments are happy to discuss the good, but not so much the bad and the ugly. So I, I, I'm just glad that we're using this space uh, in a state where healthcare is the biggest industry. I think it's $60 billion a year. And in a city that people are always calling a medical mecca, we, we can discuss here some of the less comfortable issues in medicine. And tonight that is moral injury. I want to give you just a quick two-minute WBUR take on moral injury. So a few years ago, we started to hear about moral injury in relation to veterans. And in fact, my amazing colleague, Martha Biebinger, did a story. Michael, you want to put it up? Um, about You've probably heard of a, a MacArthur genius locally, a VA psychiatrist, Jonathan Shea, who developed the concept of moral injury. And he was talking about how, uh, here's what Martha wrote, that he would hear these stories again and again, and Shea constructed a pattern. A soldier betrays his or her sense of what's right under orders in a high stakes situation. By the mid 1990s, he started calling the condition that results moral injury. Imagine someone you trust telling you to do something you feel is deeply wrong in a possible life and death situation and you do it. So that so Martha wrote that back in 2013. And by the way, she noted that Shay pointed out that the concept of moral injury comes right out of the Iliad and thousands of years of, of war. Okay, so then in 2018, I did a story about moral injury in the other kind of vets, veterinarians. Uh, and in, it's incredibly widespread. A, a really interesting study found that uh, more than two thirds of veterinarians, re veterinarians reported experiencing moral injury. And the, the local veterinarian at Angel uh, Animal Medical Center who did this research said, um, you know, we're in the really unenviable and really difficult position of caring for patients, maybe for their entire lives, developing our own relationships with those animals, and then being asked to kill them. So that's the, that was the veterinarian aspect of, of moral injury. Um, and then tonight, we will be talking about the healthcare version, and Michael, you can put up Wendy's post. So this post was recently, just recently on Common Health, it's gotten more than 55,000 clicks, uh, and it's clearly having tremendous resonance. So that's tonight's topic. Also, before we get started, um, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, two very special guests. Is Steve Bergman here? Yes, so anyone who read, also known as Samuel Shem, anyone who read House of God or his most, he has a new book out called Man's Fourth Greatest Hospital, right? <laughs> Fourth best hospital, <laughs> sorry, I had to change the name a little more. Um, he is here, and is Will Lautzenheiser here? Yay, Will, so Will, indescribable, <laughs> but one of just a, a truly extraordinary filmmaker, comedian, and um, patient of, of Simon's. So um, welcome, special welcomes to you both. Okay, format of the panel is that each of our panelists is going to speak for about five minutes telling their story. 
then I will ask them a few questions, and then we will have questions from you. Um, and you might want to, while you're, while you're listening, um, the way that you can ask questions is to use uh, a tool that we have called Slido, S-L-I-D-O. You don't have to download anything. We'll have it up on the screen pretty soon. You just go to slido.com in your phone's web browser. You enter the code hashtag moral injury to submit your questions. You you can do this anonymously if you'd like, and you can also upvote the questions that you want answered the most. So slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. When we get to the question and answer period, we will, um, we will never make public, in, in case anyone wants to share any stories or anything that might be sensitive, um, we will not make public, we are recording the session, but we will not make that part of the session public so that people can feel freer to speak, or you can just submit an, an, an anonymous comment on Slido. Um, so first, let me begin with Wendy Dean. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So thanks so much. It is such a pleasure to be here and to really expand this conversation. It's what an opportunity that BUR has given us. Um, if any of you have read the post uh, about um, that accompanied this um, event, you know that my husband was very ill about three years ago. And I think that was the final push that tipped me over into um, really getting serious about doing something about clinician distress. As a clinician myself, I had spent decades trying to, you know, decade and a half, trying to practice in a way that I felt was good for patients and good for clinicians, that provided the best care. Um, and I had moved from academia to a private practice to direct patient care. And what I realized was I kept trying to find that situation where I could give my patients my undivided attention, where billing didn't get in the way between us, where um, I didn't have to answer to an insurance company or to a healthcare system in order to get them what they needed. And that became increasingly hard. And eventually, I couldn't make it work where I lived. And I ended up going in and um, doing um, research funding oversight management to help patients in a different way. Um, but then when my husband got ill, I saw it from the family side. And what I saw was that there were practitioners who just couldn't see their way clear around the barriers that their hospitals and their healthcare system had put up between us as family and patient and their care. And it was beginning to impact the care that patients were getting. And my husband survived. He's actually in the back. Um, he's <laughs> thriving now. Um, but what I realized was it was a very near miss for us. And we're a two physician family. And in fact, he worked for one of the hospitals, the original hospital that he was at. Um, and if we couldn't figure out how to get the care that he needed, um, what was gonna happen to my farmer neighbor who didn't have that ability to advocate, who didn't know what risk management was, who didn't know anybody at the Patriot News to call need be. Um, and that's and so that really gave me the push to start focusing more on how do we fix the system so that patients aren't hurt and clinicians aren't hurt and we can all come together to make this better. Wow, that was only three minutes. <laughs> do you have more? Do you want to add a couple? So and what I what I was the other the other piece that I was thinking about is um, all of these physicians who were treating my husband were clearly beaten. They, you know, they're just, there was not any spark. There was no fire behind them in their belly. Um, and when I talked to friends who were at the tops of their fields across the country, I would hear them say, I love my job, I love my patients, and doing that work, but everything around it is just, it is wearing me to a nub. And so I started thinking, I, I hear a lot about burnout and 
that burnout is the big thing in healthcare and that physici- half of physicians are burned out. But almost to a one, when I talk to my friends, they would say, yeah, no, that doesn't, it just doesn't sit well with me. I, you know, I'm not burned out. Um, I'm tired of, of all of the um, sort of housekeeping things I have to do and I'm tired of the wedges that are between me and my patients, but I still love my work. And that's when I started thinking about what is, what is the, what might be the other, um, what else is going on here? And as Simon and I started talking, um, we started saying the, the problem for us is that we made an oath, we made a promise to our patients that we would put them as a priority always. And we trained for a decade with that deeply held belief that our patients always came first. They came before our kids' birthdays. They came before our anniversary dinners. They came before anything. Um, They came before our need to eat or sleep. And then we were in practice. As As we got more and more into practice, we realized that oftentimes we have to choose other than our patients. We have to choose, um, to take care of the EHR rather than looking our patients in the eyes. We have to take care of prior authorization so that our patients can get an MRI. Um, we have to choose to refer within a hospital system rather than outside, even though that we know that maybe the specialist who's outside of our system is better because of leakage constraints. And so um, that's where the, the idea for moral injury came in that we take an oath and every day our hands are tied from doing what we really know is right. Thank you, Andy. Simon. So so I came about this um, from a very different end of the spectrum. I'm I'm a busy um, clinician, a busy plastic surgeon, hand surgeon um, in the city here. Um, I also have a a large research lab and um, have the privilege of working overseas and doing some volunteer work as well. My my wife is a pathologist. So, um, you know, I'm fairly well embedded in the medical system. And, and interestingly, you know, obviously, Wendy comes from a psychiatry background. I come from a plastic surgery background. So when we started talking about this and realizing that we had a common thread, th- that was really the, where the, the fire started. Um, but I'll start by telling you my story. Um, about uh, three or four years ago, um, like most of the places in town, um, we started to, l- or the, the hospitals were looking at um, clinician distress and saying, we, we know we've got a lot of burned out clinicians, but let's, let's survey them, let's see what the real story is. And I sat at my computer and I filled out the check boxes about, about burnout. And some of you will know burnout is a constellation of exhaustion, cynicism, and, and, um, and lack of accomplishment. And I started to realize that I was kind of clicking a five on everything. (laughs) I was pretty cynical. I was exhausted all the time. And although I knew objectively that I was achieving a lot in my my job, I just felt like I wasn't making progress. And um, as I I looked at that, I I did have a little anxiety about the fact that what was the hospital going to do when they saw my results? Was I going to be hauled off somewhere? Were they going to get upset at me? Was I going to have to go into retraining? Um, and so I did what any good uh, clinician scientist does, and I, I, I read everything I could about it. I went to the internet, and I read every article that was out there, and, and there, are, there are names in this that, are, that have written things and have YouTube videos, and I thought, I, I will teach myself how to fix this problem. So uh, after reading these different things, I went out and I, I got a clinician coach, and I had a coach who'd come to my office every Monday evening. Um, I bought a little fridge that fitted under my desk so that I could put good food and water under my desk and I could eat more healthily. Um, I bought a, a membership to the Plum Island Beach, and I'd go up to the beach and, and run on the beach. Um, and I even, I'd even heard that pet therapy was good, so I would borrow the neighbor's um, black Labrador and I would take <laughs> the, the black Labrador out running. And, and so by all accounts, I said, you know, I've kind of doing everything that I should possibly do. So like any scientist, I, I revisited the issue about uh, six to 12 months later and said, how am I doing? So I went online and I filled out the boxes and I realized none of the things that were being told to me that fix burnout were actually fixing the problem that I was going through. And um, at the time, Wendy was uh, working uh, with me um, on some grants that I, I work on and we got talking about this. and. And it became apparent that the thing that was bothering me, the thing that was deep down inside um, causing my symptoms of burnout, my exhaustion, my depersonalization, my lack of accomplishment, were about uh, were, were the issues, the things that were getting between me and my patients. It was the trying to take really good care of someone, but knowing that I really don't have as much time as I want to to spend with that person, or trying to see that person 
and knowing that I know they need an MRI scan, but I know their insurance company is going to make me jump through a whole bunch of hoops to get that MRI scan. And there are myriad different things we could talk about, and I'm sure we'll get to some of those, and Wendy's already uh, talked about them. But it was those little wedges that get between you and your patient. And it's not one that does it. It's the fact that so frequently in healthcare today, um, you have time and time again little things that prevent you doing what you know to be the exactly the best thing for, for your patient. Or if you, they don't prevent it and you do it anyway, they come at significant cost, either time or personal cost. And these are the things that start to get between you and the patient, which is, I think, why the vast, vast majority of doctors went into medicine to, to take good care of somebody. Thank you, Simon Stewart. So I'm Stuart Pollack. I'm a general internist, a primary care provider. I think I'm on year 29, um, 15 very nice years in Auburn, Massachusetts with Reliant Healthcare, and then actually 11 years at the, at the Brigham. Um, I, you know, the best explanation, the best easy explanation of uh, moral injury I ever heard was uh, somebody said to me, moral injury is basically a bait and switch. Right, so the, and well, I'm sure we're gonna talk about the switch, but the, you know, the bait is very interesting. So, I mean, there's a universal bait in healthcare, be it a, a psychiatrist, a surgeon, a primary care doctor, nurses, honestly, the people who enter the phone at the front of my office, and that's, and we all wanna help people. Uh, but the, you know, then the baits get more complicated, and in primary care, the bait is really the relationship with the patient. So I have hired and trained a mind-moggling number of primary care doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, um, and, and they're all there for the relationship. And there's just been this slow eating away at the relationship. Um, and so, you know, you know, when you come into my office, we currently, you know, screen you for all these good things. I don't actually believe in some like there's some evil conspiracy against the relationship. I just think there's a lot of really good things that are squeezing it out. So, you know, we ask you if you're depressed, if there's you're a victim of domestic violence, you have a substance use problem, we have to do your medicines. We um, there's a lot of boxes to check for billing. You know, for the last two weeks, we've asked you if you've been out of the country for 30 days and been around somebody with coronavirus. And it's a good thing. You don't want to be in my waiting room with somebody who left China a week ago. Um, I always joke that we, one day we will get to the point where by the time we cover everything we have to do, that we'll say, you know, oh, we're done with the visit. And the patient will go, but I came here because my <laughs> ankle hurt. Um, and so there's, you know, this whole part of what I do, which I tend to think of as, you know, what's the matter and what matters to you? Right, and the what matters to you, the getting to know the patient as a human being and their values, you know, that's the benefit. That's why PCPs do this, and we're just sort of running out of time. And so, you know, I tend to think of this as you know, death by a thousand cuts. You know, it's not that I'm making some horrible decision about whether you can have the drug or not. Right, it, it's I'm you know making this decision in every visit is do I stop looking at the computer and stop clicking and pay attention because this is like a key moment and I really need to be very actively listening, and every time I do that I know well my son is thirty but you know after the kids go to bed that I have to go on the computer and spend a couple hours because I didn't do it during the visit and you just do that over and over twenty times a day and it just slowly eats at people. Thank you, Stuart. Elizabeth. Howdy, y'all. My name's Elizabeth. I am a legislative fellow and healthcare policy analyst at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, uh, which is in Austin, Texas. It's a liberty-minded, free market think tank. And my story is actually about my mother. Um, this time last year, after beating stage four colon cancer, her insurance company allowed her to get genetic testing to see what else potentially could come up in her future due to her family history and also with her age. She's only in her mid-50s. And everything came back clear, except she did test positive for the BRCA2 gene. So because of that, um, and due to her family history and such, the, her and my dad decided that she should go through the preventative double mastectomy and hysterectomy. So St. Patrick's Day last year, she underwent that surgery, and it was completely fine, two nights stay, perfect. Um, while she was going through that surgery, she had told the plastic surgeon who was going to complete the stitching up at the end, sorry for the layman terms, um, that she didn't care how it looked. She just wanted to be there to see her grandkids in the future. So just make it whatever. Being a good plastic surgeon, he was like, I'm gonna make this look pretty. And unfortunately, within four weeks, they the stitches opened up. So that was April. 
um, to the point where she almost missed my graduate school graduation in May down in Texas. So couldn't find a surgeon in time to fix those stitches, and then it was a constant battle just to find a surgeon and a time to do the outpatient surgery to fix those stitches. Uh, on her birthday, July 22nd, she finally found a surgeon and a space to do so. So she went to the North Shore of Long Island, where they live, um, outpatient ward, supposed to be in and out, dad dropped her off in the morning, my sister was supposed to pick her up that afternoon. As she was waking up from the surgery to fix her stitches, she found out that the insurance company, her employer-sponsored employer insurance company, denied her a machine that she was required to go home with, which would, and again, sorry, layman terms, hold both sides of the stitches together like a suction cup so they wouldn't open again to really make sure this one and done, no more problems. So she wakes up from surgery and is informed that she won't be getting this machine. And the doctor who had prescribed it was like, well, I can't send you home without this machine because we're gonna have the same problem again in four weeks. And then went a four day battle between her physician and her insurance company with the insurance company basically playing provider by saying, we're not sending you home with this machine. So again, on her birthday, stuck there for four days, which the visit ends up costing way more than the machine would have to the insurance company to begin with. My parents run a small business on Long Island. Um, since she was planning on being out of patient day, she hadn't gone ahead and done the administrative paperwork for the week, so then people's payrolls were delayed, um, and this whole big mess ended up happening. Thankfully, on day four, the insurance company finally gave in and allowed her to have the machine, but at the end of the day, she was completely disheartened. I would call her every day from Austin and be like, all right, what's the update? To the point where by day three, she was like, stop calling because I'm just gonna keep getting upset because no one likes to stay in an inpatient ward in the hospital. It's not the best time. Um, thankfully, it all worked out, but at the end of the day, she was so disheartened by her insurance company. The doctor was getting frustrated at the system, trying to take it out on her because he was just so angry he couldn't send her home. Obviously, my family, I'm in Austin. My sister lives in Pennsylvania. Thankfully, she was able to go home. Um, just a really rough time. While we can't be there to help her, even though she should have gotten the help because this was a prescribed thing, and the insurance company just said, nope, not today. Wow. So we've just heard the stories of what basically landed you all here. And they they are stories that I think I think hundreds of thousands of physicians and probably millions of patients would have similar stories or at least along the same themes. So my first question is, so why aren't you accompanied by masses and masses and masses of people as you you know come out with sort of a campaign to say we need to talk about this and this needs to change? Where is everybody? <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll start with it. I, yeah. I think there's a bunch of different reasons, and they're different for everybody. Um, I think that um, there is some sort of fear behind it. I mean, it takes a little bit of energy and a little bit of <coughs> courage sometimes to talk about these things, and there are there there's fear about your job in some situations. I mean, I think we, we work for supportive places that understand what this is about, but that's not true for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think, secondly, people are absolutely exhausted. People are um, they're at their wits end with some of this stuff. And um, I think there's only so much energy people can keep throwing into a system if they don't see it changing. And that brings you through to the idea of learned helplessness. I think there's people who say, I, I can't make any change. I'll just, I'll just stick it out and do my best. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that affects us all. We're all patients one day. And um, if we don't do something about it, we're all gonna be affected one way or another. Anybody wanna add anything? Yeah, that covered it. <laughs> um, so here's my pushback question. You're calling <coughs> what ails American medicine moral injury. But you're also talking about, it's clear that there are a lot of other things going on. There's exhaustion, There's there could be tedium, there could be repetition, there could be some of our brightest people go into medicine and sometimes medicine doesn't always need all of your brains to do the same thing over and over again. Um, there, and, and so there could be many other things going on. How do you, what makes you say, Wendy, that it's moral injury specifically? Well, what's really interesting is we had that same question. So when we did the original article, when we wrote that original article, it was a thought experiment that we said, here's a way for us to conceptualize what we think is going on, but we don't know if anybody else is gonna agree. 
And just to back up the original article, in stat. In stat yeah. news, thank you in very stat, much. If you're here, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, Pat Skerritt? Thank you. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so um, stat news was very gracious and was willing to take a risk with us and to say, all right, let's throw this out to the medical community and sort out whether it really resonates with anybody or not. And um, I think to date, Pat can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's somewhere north of 250,000 downloads of the article, mm -hmm. and it's still going. It was the mm -hmm. third most read article last year, wow. um, even though it was published in 2018. And you were just in the Washington Post? We were just in the Washington Post. We were The British Medical Journal has picked us up. JAMA has picked us up. Um, and um, the article for you also gained a lot of traction with mm -hmm. 55,000 views. So I think what that says is this resonates profoundly. And we've had hundreds of emails that are in many, at many times heartbreaking um, of people saying, this is the language that I have been looking for for the last 10 years, 20 years. This is my experience. And so although we don't, it's 18 months in, we don't really have, we haven't had enough time to get hard scientific data, um, it sure seems like a lot of people agree with this conceptualization. Mm -hmm. Stuart. And, and I would just talk and toss in from a very doctor way of looking at things that, you know, burnout is a symptom or a series of symptoms. Um, and it is, I mean, one of the things you learn is, you know, treating a symptom without knowing the underlying problem is a little bit dangerous, right? So I think if you pain medicines for your broken leg, but I don't actually fix your broken leg, it actually doesn't turn out well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you learn is, you know, a lot of different diseases can cause a symptom. So, you know, from my point of view, I don't think it's just moral injury, but I think it's definitely one of the underlying causes. Um, and like you said, you know, there, I think we went through this stage where we were just going to treat the symptom. You know, if I you just got a massage and ate healthier, this would all be fine. And I don't think that's actually worked out. Uh, and, and again, again, no, don't knock it. I mean, when your leg is broken, we still treat your pain. Uh, but you really do have to get at the underlying causes. So you're saying moral injury could be the underlying, a significant underlying cause of burnout. I, I would, again, I don't think anybody's really taken apart that way, but again, the re it resonates with people. When you talk to doctors and nurses, there is this sort of that's it kind of moment. Yeah, yeah, bingo. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, as, as Wendy said, I mean, we are, we are collecting stories, the number of people that have emailed us their story, and they're not little trivial stories. These are full page, hey, this happened to me, this happened to my father, this happened... To, to, to people I know, I mean, we literally have folders and folders of this stuff, people telling us these stories that we've heard over and over again, which are f fabulous in one sense because it validates what we're talking about. But as Wendy said, at the same time, it's heartbreaking that there's so many people that are pushed to the point of even even just sending an email about this stuff. I mean, people really are, are profoundly affected. So what are you going to do with all those stories? <laughs> um, we're just trying at this point to not get buried in them. <laughs> but at some point, I think um, that's our data that says this is what's wrong with the healthcare system and this is, this is the evidence of what needs to change. And so we are compiling them together. We're looking for patterns and we will start developing um, initiatives for how to change those big patterns. And no one else was really doing that. Like there was no other mechanism except for maybe like complaints to boards of medicine or something, right? To, well, uh, or there have definitely that? been there have been efforts to address um, burnout at the symptom level, a little bit yeah. like what Stu was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, there have been quite significant efforts, but a lot of those focus around things that are symptom relief. It's a little bit like mm -hmm. the person who has pain, they get pain medication. Well, if somebody comes in and says they're exhausted, you send them on a weekend retreat. If somebody comes in and says they're, you know, they're, they're, they're struggling to, you know, relate to their patients, you send them to a yoga weekend. These things, these, and I say it not sort of seriously as well, it's literally the, the level of some of the stuff. And it's not done maliciously, it's done with very good intention. Yeah. Like, what can we do to help you when you're struggling? Um, but we're not getting at the cause of it. So there were things being done, they just weren't attacking the cause of it. Got it. So um, I think there's a, there's a glaring political question that needs to be asked, which is, um, you know, I think to me the most noteworthy phenomenon of this political season, setting aside the personalities involved, is that healthcare is by far the biggest issue on everybody's mind. And there's been a, an amazing 
visible upsurge of discontent with our healthcare system as it is. So how does your work and the things that you're pointing out, how do they translate into political action if they do? Elizabeth, let's start with you, yeah. So I think the first thing to recognize is this isn't a red-blue issue, right? My parents are in New York, we're in Massachusetts right now, but this is also seen in Texas. So it goes across the spectrum. Um, at the end of the day, it's hard to say if changing our healthcare system so radically to something like single payer will change anything or in the opposite direction of having no government involvement whatsoever. At the end of the day, any policy area that should be discussed by politicians during this election cycle or in the future when they're making policy is how to get patients back into that patient doctor relationship that's at the, what should be at the heart of your healthcare. It shouldn't be patient insurer doctor, it should just be patient directly to doctor. Whether that's by giving more choices through, I do a lot of research studying the expansion of health savings accounts so people have more options when determining their health care or direct primary care. It's, it will be hard to say just to see how it actually plays out. But again, this isn't a conservative liberal issue. It's a just bringing it back to physician and patient issue. Hmm. So, and you work at a conservative think tank, right? I do so work at a conservative the, yeah. think so there's tank. The, there's the, how about a blue state view? Yeah. I mean, uh, I <laughs> Not mean, that it's red and blue. <laughs> yeah. We, we've heard from people in all sorts of different systems. I mean, we've had, we've had people, I mean, I was in London this weekend and meeting with the, the Royal College of Physicians there. We've been to, um, we've heard from Canada. I grew up in New Zealand. We've certainly heard from New Zealand, Australia, uh, Japan, Mexico, South Africa. It's everywhere. Germany. Like people I mean, are saying, it's happening everywhere. People it's are not our pe healthcare system. People are saying they've they've got a, a a problem with this, and so what that tells tells me at least is it's not a system specific thing. Now there are different aspects to each system which drive this kind of thing. For example, when you have a system like in the UK, you know this th there. You know, your goal is to save money for the system, right? As opposed to make money for an insurance company, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. nevertheless, whatever system you're in, there are there are drivers that create these continuous double binds about trying to take care of the patient, but something getting in the way of it. And it doesn't matter what that something is. Yeah. Are, are there countries where they don't they don't seem to have a problem with it? We haven't come across them yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that to be fair, there are there are places we've been to um, that seem to be doing better than other places. Uh -huh. um, and there are a number of different reasons for that. Um, most often having clinicians at the at the helm of what's going on. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Stuart, did you want to say something? I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I don't know what year of Romney care we're on at this point, but you know, we've proved that universal coverage doesn't equal universal access. Um, and you know, at least in the primary care business, I always tell people every happy ending of the U.S. healthcare crisis is really dependent on primary care. But you know, there's very good evidence now that primary care is actually shrinking in this country, um, that the number of visits are dropping. It's, yeah. I don't want to go too far off. Of, this is my thing. <laughs> okay. But um, and, and so, and I go back and forth, right? Because it's you know, I have a complex relationship with the government. I don't really want the government delivering care. But you know, most of the debate on healthcare is. Right, who writes the check, but you know how they write the check and how the system works matters. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, part of health care, the problem in healthcare is we just keep getting better, right? So we keep inventing things that work, but we haven't changed the delivery system, mm -hmm. right? So we've, you know, I'm in the same still 15 minute visit that we were in the 60s, but in the 60s, diabetes care was like two insulin, you boiled your urine to see if there was sugar, we tracked like three metrics. Now I have hundreds of medicines and honestly 20 metrics we follow around quality and it's the same visit. It's incredible. Okay, so that leads us to the what is to be done, Wendy. So I, I think that this is, um, it is a complex question and the Bottom line is, no one person can do this alone. No one organization can do this alone. Um, <clears throat> physicians can't fix this on their own. We need, we need a coalition of physicians and patients who are working together as a community to change how we think about healthcare and I think to align what, our, what the incentives are across all of the stakeholders. So across the um, hospitals, the insurers, the, um, even the government needs to align what its incentives are um, so that it all focuses on getting the patient the care they need 
and allowing physicians and other clinicians to provide that. Tom? Um, and Wendy sort of said it perfectly, but um, the way that we've been conceptualizing that concept of uh, aligning those incentives and trying to um, bring bring care back to healthcare is um, three three parts: um, valuing clinicians because they're a key part of the care you get, um, valuing the relationship between clinicians and patients um, because, as we've talked about, putting the patient front and center is what really um, strengthens that relationship and, and uh, matters perhaps the most out of all of those things. And finally, organizing community and getting together and having people work together on this kind of thing. Um, because as Wendy said, there's, there's no one person that's gonna be able to do it. Um, but I do think we need to take both clinicians and patients into that group and have people recognize that this isn't a doctor problem and it's not just a patient problem, it's actually all of us together. And although we're all clinicians, we're also all patients at various times and we need to remember that. And we can go into the weeds on it about, uh, you know, electronic healthcare records, which are obviously a, a big thing, um, about the different payment structures that we have, um, about the way our hospitals organize things that they do. These are all minor parts of it, but if we value clinicians, we value the relationship and we get together and work together, those are the three key tenets. Stuart or Elizabeth, do you want to add anything? Stuart, yeah. I mean, I'm going to sort of echo what they said. I mean, fundamentally for a system where we take up a huge amount of the gross national product money that could be spent on other things and where, you know, again, it's not just physicians, but it's nurses. Pretty, you know, half of people in healthcare are burned out. And generally, patients aren't really happy with the healthcare system. You know, things don't change. And they don't change because, honestly, life isn't that bad if you're a pharmaceutical company or an insurance company or, honestly, even a hospital system. Um, and so it seems to me that, you know, any change in healthcare is a coalition of, you know, the clinicians um, and the patients because that's honestly who's suffering. Elizabeth? Sure, and from a patient family perspective, while sometimes it's hard to share your story and talk about in a forum like this or even to your family friends or your physician, I think just having these moments to share your story will help move the needle, hopefully in the right direction. Okay, and um, our panelists will be around for a few minutes, I think now. Please join me in, thank, in, in thanking them. For all thank you. Time.